and welcome back to Music Nuggets. This is the first nugget for a long time. I've been away, been doing other things, um, but I'm back now. And one of the main reasons that I've been motivated to come back is I've got a lot of new subscribers. So thank you very much. Um, if you like what you see today, feel free to hit the like button and subscribe and the notification. Um, so today is all about something that many people have been asking about. Um, so I've had a few, a few comments saying, can you do something about Mark Rebo or Mark Rebo? Not entirely sure on the pronunciation. Um, yeah, it seems that you guys understand my taste somewhat uh, by now. And he's a guitar player that I've liked for a long time. He has played guitar with Tom Waits. So I just played a Tom Waits piece there just now. And he's played with Elvis Costello and John Zorn. And he's had his own bands playing Cuban music and um, a thing called Ceramic Dog, which is really sort of punky, noisy, abrasive kind of stuff. And I like it all. It's really good, all of it. Um, I think he's a really tasteful player and quite a misunderstood player. I think a lot of people are attracted to him just because he's a lot of the time quite abstract and weird and wonky. But if you really analyse what he's doing, he's really on point with chord tones and stuff like that. Um, that's why I've chosen to do uh, Jockey Full of Bourbon, the Tom Waits piece. And the f first thing I wanted to explore really was how he plays a lot of harmonic minor stuff and really, really aims at chord tones. So I have a lot of harmonic minor material on the board here. and. Basically, we're going to do what we normally do with Music Nuggets and try and give you as many tools to sound like the thing that we're talking about and to be able to improvise within that area. Um, but first, I'm just going to go through that song, uh, Jockey Full of Bourbon, um, because I think it really highlights how he treats playing over chords and landing on chord tones and being really on point that way. So, so it starts with, well, first of all, I should emphasize the tune is mainly just two chords. Um, e minor, so that's the, and then when it hits this note, it's a B7, um, and there's a couple of moments where it hits a A minor, so it's basically a 1, 4, 5 in minor, or harmonic minor, however you want to see that, but I think he really sees it as harmonic minor. Um, so just taking you through how he hits chord tones, I think it's it's great um, and like incredible, really great phrasing. And this is why it's great phrasing. So over the E minor to begin with, and that's root fifth minor third of the E minor. And then it lands on this note. So when it hits the B7 chord, that's giving you the fifth of the B7. So you're getting this effect nice, really deep. Um, and then you've got, so what's happening there is it's going from the fifth of B7 down to the third chromatically and then back up to the root of the E minor, exactly at the point where it changes back to that E minor, which is awesome. Um, and it keeps happening, this just keeps happening and happening. So. Then it goes, so all that is, is the minor third of the B minor, down to the root, which is super great. And then it fleetingly goes to this A minor, and it does the same thing, so it's continuation of line, continuation of phrasing. From the minor third down to the root again. And then you have back to the root of the E minor. So it's all really on point with the chords. And then you've got a little run through root, third, fifth of the E minor. Dances around on that for a while. Nice syncopation. And when it hits that note, so all you've done is go through an E minor arpeggio. There's no extra notes, there's no outside of the chord tones. Third, fifth. When it hits that note, that's the seventh of the B7. And then it does a really cool thing. It sort of plays on kind of augmented against the B7. 
So that's the sharp fifth or flat six is a better way to see it because it's a flat six in the harmonic minor scale. So that's flat six, fifth, fourth, down to the third of the B7. And then similar staggered phrasing for flat nine down to the fifth of the B7. So what it's, what it's doing is it's giving the impression of an extended B7 chord, so it's creating more tension before it resolves. So that flat 13, if you put that into the B7 chord, you get that. B7 flat 13, and also B7 flat 9. So lots of tension before it resolves. And then it dances around on, this is like a, a flat fifth thing that he's doing here on the E minor, so. Oh, sorry, yeah. So that's just dancing around like, imagine the E minor chord. And it's going. Yeah, so it's just gnarly, I guess. That's one of the things that he's known for. And then, and this is my favorite part of all of it, this really smart chromatic run down to the fifth of the B. Which is really quite like sinister circus kind of sounds. And then it just plays a B arpeggio. Third, fifth, fifth root, and then it's playing on. It's just running down a uh, E harmonic minor scale from the flat six, or from the fifth actually. So that's like in this E harmonic minor scale. Do uh, do 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 do, and then it goes. So that's just an E minor arpeggio, but it slides into the A minor that leads into the vocal part, which is super cool again. So as you can see, it's all really, really on point with chord tones. It's like almost nothing but chord tones. And then when something spicy happens with chromaticisms, it makes it all the spicier, it makes it all the more interesting. Um, so I think that's one of the ways in which he's like a misunderstood guitar player uh, or misunderstood by a lot of people at least because I think a lot of people think that he's just kind of like, you know, really weird, gnarly, strange, diminished riffs and stuff like that. He is known for flat fifths um, and double stops. He plays a lot of chordal things within his solos, so he'll, he'll do things like... do things like that quite a lot so that's just playing around with the chord tones and sliding around um one of the things for improvising with this that that i've sort of taken from that is you can split that up into single notes and a really good trick is just to learn where all your chord tones are in this case in an e minor arpeggio and learn where those all are and you can approach each one from a semitone below, preferably on an offbeat so that you hit the chord tone on the downbeat. So that's what the arrows are here. I just play and so on. Yeah. Um, and that's really cool. You can also turn that into little bits of chords. So you could take that note and that note, that note and that note, that note and that note, you know, and do things like... Uh, um, which is really effective in a, in a ribble kind of way. Um, yeah, and I think crucial is learning the harmonic minor scale itself. So root, second, minor, third, fourth, fifth, flat six, major seven, and then back to the root again. So that's what gives it this sort of spiciness, and that's why it plays it really nicely into that B7 chord. Because the third of the B7 chord is the major seventh of the harmonic minor scale. So, 
So that's what you've got here. And you can see both an E minor, E, fifth, root, third, fifth, and the B7 here, root, fifth, root, third, fifth, root. Um, so it's, it, it's quite sort of obvious that those chords are going to come out of it. For improvising, I think it's good to really get used to where the chord tones are and also play on the tension and the release. I don't think it's like, crazy important to know exactly where all the modes of this are. Um, it's more important to know what chord you're on at any time and what tones from the scale to use for that. So to focus really intently on the tension and the release, um, what I've done here is map out, I've just selected, rather than say a minor seven arpeggio, which we couldn't really use here because there's a major seven in the scale in the overall tonality, and it really, it really feels like that major seven is involved at all times. Um, I've mapped up an E minor add nine arpeggio, and what that is, is exactly what it sounds like. It's an E minor with an added nine. So an added, you can see it as a second as well. So the ninth is up here, and here's the second. Otherwise, we've got E minor. So. <laughs> And we're adding this note. And the reason that I uh, decided to use this is because it's it's kind of implied in the song straight away. It goes. So if you put an E minor on the bass there. You get that sound over a couple of octaves. Um, and just in that one position, it's this. And I think that's a sound that really focuses the, the E minor flavor. Um, just adding that ninth and not choosing to use a seventh. I think a seventh would really balance the, the chord out too much. You could add the major seventh, but then the B is going to have less impact when it comes around if you're using that major seven already, because that's a key component in the B7 chord. Um, that's something that you can use still. It's up to you um, in terms of improvising. That would sound like, so if you take a minor arpeggio and you add this note, then you get this sound, which is extremely cool. <laughs> But that feels almost like it should go more with the B7, so I've chosen this instead. So that would be release material. The harmonic minor itself is release material. This arpeggio thing that I was demonstrating earlier, that would be release material. Depending on how you land it. If you land on one of those notes below, it's going to sound like tension material. Um, so I, I would say try using that to begin with as your main release material, your main E minor chord material. And I've chosen a few things for the tension stuff. One really obvious thing is over any dominant chord, you can use a diminished arpeggio from the major third or the fifth or the flat seventh or the flat nine. Um, so B7 root is there and you can see the fifth and the third of the B7, and that's the fifth again, and there's the flat nine. Um, oh, um, we're missing a seventh. There's the seventh there. So the seventh of the chord, I've just put it in a different place. But you probably know, if you, if you play a fair bit already, that diminished arpeggios just repeat every minor third. So if you can get that, pattern under your fingers, you can find it all over the fretboard and it's the same sound. So I, I tend to think of it as coming from the third of the chord. So that's the third of the B7. So I would tend to start it there or there or there. And, and you can repeat that every three frets. So. And it always, almost always lands a semitone away from your home chord. Which is really great. So 
You're kind of always there or thereabouts with how it lands, um, which is really great for creating tension and then resolving. Um, you've got to be careful with that because it can just sound pretty common. It can sound a lot like uh, cheap metal, I guess, um, if you're not careful with how you phrase it. Chromaticisms within it really help, you know, so doing things like... <laughs> And things like that can really help. All I'm doing is adding the notes in between there and being careful how I land. It takes a bit of practice. Um, another thing that's really fun is from the f from the sh flat 13 of the B7 chord, so like root third, fifth. Now 13 is a six, so a flat six would be here. So, so that's a flat 13. You can play augmented stuff. Now, I haven't mapped that up, but what I have mapped up is it's basically an augmented scale, augmented arpeggio with, yeah, I should say it's an augmented arpeggio, not an augmented scale, with a flat 7. Uh, so it's like thinking about it being rooted in B. So it's basically a B7 with a flat 13. So it sounds like this. So it's this shape here. <laughs> patterns with that and mix it with standard fourths and seconds from from the harmonic minor scale and you can come up with licks like or and that resolves really nicely to to E as well you've, you've got to work on your phrasing a little bit and getting used to how these things fall um, but you will be able to hear the tension straight away. And one last thing that I think is pretty interesting is this symmetrical scale. It's basically just harmonic minor with no third, no minor third. And it, it basically uh, gives you a symmetrical scale. So you'll see tone, semitone, minor third, semitone, tone, minor third. Tone, semitone, minor third, semitone, tone, minor third. And it just keeps repeating like that. And there's something in that. It's not a diminished scale because that's just tone, semitone, tone, semitone, tone, semitone. Um, but it's, it's got a similar vibe. You've got to be careful if you're using that for your tension material over the B7 because it's got the E in it still. So I would be conscious to try and avoid that E a little bit. Um, but it's useful for all sorts of things, so it's a good thing to learn. I'll do a lesson later about how you can use that in blues. Um, but but that basically sounds like this. So starting from the lowest note. You can hear that that's going to serve that chord. So it's pretty useful that that thing as well. Um, so yeah, um, what I'll do is I've put a little loop down of of uh, the two chords, the E minor and the B7, and I'll, I'll just try and I'll try and focus on the release material when it's on the E minor and the tension material when it's on the B7. And one other thing, um, I'll probably use quite a lot of little double stops as well because that's another thing that Rebo does a lot. So, and he does double stops with ninths and flat ninths too. So learning the scale and learning where you've got two notes of semitone apart is really useful for that gnarly Rebo sound. So, um, good example is if you want to play the seven and the root of the harmonic minor scale together, you can. You can do that, and that's real gnarly against an E. You can also, less gnarly, because it's sweeter, because it's a ninth, is you can play the ninth and the third together. So, so that's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two. So the two is the nine, and that's the minor third again. So you can play those together, and those sound great too. 
and you can play them a semi uh, an octave apart as well. So there's the ninth. No, that's the minor third of the E. And there's the ninth, so you can do things like that. Um, so that's that's like a really good way of getting to his sound a little bit as well. So, without further ado. in there um, but it's Rebo I guess uh, yeah I really hope that what he what he did on Jockey Full of Bourbon was written because if it's not it's incredible phrasing and as much as I tried to start off tasteful there you get carried away with messing about with these scales so hopefully all these bits and pieces can help you in some way um, for the people who asked about Rebo I think that's a large part of his playing I'll do another lesson at some point about the the really strange like shape based and diminished things that he does um, because there's quite a lot to say about that too. But until then, thanks very much for watching. If you like this, subscribe, hit the like button and I will see you next time. Bye bye.